I'm here talking to the editors of the new MLA volume on uh, digital pedagogy. It's a very different approach for us, and I was wondering if you guys could tell us, you know, how did this project come about? Years of love. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually did start it in, well, I think it started a little bit with Kathy and Gentry before an MLA meeting, but Matt and I got involved at MLA in Seattle. I remember sitting around a table together. In fact, when I talk about it, I usually put our four pictures up on the screen, kind of like around the round table. And we were talking about wanting to do a, a digital pedagogy project, but not have it be like the typical book project, which would be reflective essays about pedagogy. But rather that if we were going to do something on digital pedagogy, it should actually use the same tools that digital pedagogy does. So. Um, and that it should actually be the stuff of, of teaching and learning and not just sort of thinking and reflecting on teaching and learning later. Right. So um, this was also a result of the 2011 roundtable that caused so much furor um, uh, for digital humanities that Kathleen Fitzpatrick ran. And Gentry and I had already been giving a lot of seminars on doing digital pedagogy to people. And we just sat down and had a conversation about the fact that we wanted the stuff and we wanted to stop reading these really long articles of teaching and learning, which are valuable in their own right, but we just wanted to steal the assignments and the syllabi. Mm -hmm. and there's no venue to do that. Uh, it was started in Zotero a little bit, but not enough that it was um, massive enough. And we wanted to also incorporate the idea that teaching grows every time you do it. It's iterative. Right. Uh, that was Gentry's idea that what we needed to do was not necessarily focus on digital tools but instead focus on the student learning goals or the outcomes or what was the actual assignment itself rather than starting with let's learn how to use blogging. Um, we wanted to turn it on its head from there. And, for, and then the MLA was really the genesis of all of this. The conventions allowed us to be able to come together uh, the four of us knew each other in other venues, and so we just started talking. And, and it was a lot of talking in terms of how are we going to construct this in a way that also allows us to do, to replicate digital pedagogy in a digital print publication. Print. Right. And tell me a little bit about the, um, the development on GitHub. How, how has that been for you, and is it a new thing? I've not seen it done with a, a volume before. <laughs> Gentry? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't know if it was a deliberate choice. I think it just maybe started happening organically, um, or we threw out an idea, and then we started to see um, how it would manifest. And uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think in, in the domain of scholarly communication and publication, it's quite rare. Um, you see it more often in digital humanities labs, some humanities centers, and of course, uh, in you know, software development. Um, I think it's been great so far. Uh, it's a neat learning curve for everyone. Um, it allows us to talk about um, uh, opening up the editing process, and this is something Rebecca's spoken to on several occasions that I find quite intriguing. Um, but also working with the MLA through that platform has been a lot of fun. So can, to what degree can you see um, and share a, a kind of a change history of a project over time? Um, and one thing I'm especially curious about is, you know, how that might be used in the future. You know, I, I think when and why that would be meaningful is still up for debate, um, but, you know, why not, given the, the ease to which you can make it available, why not try it? Um, so, yeah, I think it's quite exciting, and I, and I like the idea, again, of, of opening up not just review, but the, the entire kind of draft and editorial process. Yeah, and I, I, think, I, think I do have to say uh, really exciting is it's really just opening up the, the book entirely, and so people can see it taking shape, and because of the structure of the publication where we're doing uh, these keywords in batches, the early, the early batches are already up and people are reading them in draft. We're finding, what's exciting about that is that the materials are already kind of in circulation and, and being used and responded to, and so the project is kind of uh, gaining momentum even in its early draft stages, and that's really essential for the later stages, which are going to involve uh, public peer review. Um, and it's very hard to instantiate public peer review out of, out of nowhere. You need to kind of have built a community. And I think one of the things that GitHub has been really valuable um, is that it's, it's brought the materials out into the open. It's given visibility to the project. 
Um, and now when we're at the point where we need to kind of mobilize the academic community around this uh, larger open review, uh, we hope that, that that GitHub has been helpful in that process. And I think it will be useful. Um, I do just as a historical moment for us that Matt had already done open peer review with debates in digital humanities. And so Matt and Gentry talked Rebecca and I into doing it because Rebecca and I were the least technically savvy about GitHub. And so, we, you know, something that we could take on in, in the editorial process. Yeah. And I think, I mean, for me, the part that I find interesting, and again, this gets back at the sort of principle of the project of mirroring digital pedagogy, is that doing a project like this, we're not only opening up the editorial process just to other people in the community, but we're opening it up for students as well. I think we have so often have a really hard time convincing students, look, you know, it's you don't just write the paper one and done. It's an iterative process. Mm -hmm. And this really models it for them and they really see how scholarship is formed, how knowledge is built, and you can kind of go back and see that history. So I think there's a really great learning opportunity for students as well, you know, to take someone and show, look, this is how, you know, we do knowledge today. I, I do really appreciate that the sort of um, focus on process that DH has over, you know, this final monograph or whatever it is that we're all meant to work towards. And I wonder if you think that the people in DH are, are that bit more willing to to put themselves out there and to actually comment in public because I, I think sometimes scholars are still reticent to even do that. You know, they want it to be peer blind reviews that nobody knows who they are when they say things. Mm -hmm. Do you guys feel like you have this community in place? I think Matt, you were saying, you know, you're building the community now of people that will be willing to to have that discussion in the open. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, that certainly scholars in the digital humanities kind of have practice with these uh, new models of open scholarly communication that are taking place in Twitter and on blogs and. You know, there you, you see it in so many different ways, not just in this project, but in many other projects where you know, scholars are writing uh, draft ideas on their blogs, and really it's about a kind of uh, network group conversation. And I think that's because because there, that mode of communication has sort of saturated the digital humanities community enough, um, or various communities within digital humanities, um, we're able to to build on that. Yeah. I think if any community is going to be comfortable with this, the DH community will be really comfortable. I think one of the other things we're hoping, though, with the project is that by working with MLA, we'll be able to bring other people into that community. Yes. I, I, I understand that. I think, I mean, we have the same sort of ethos with the, with the commons, with MLA commons, and so to maybe get some of the people that are interacting there but are maybe not DHers, it seems like a logical next step for them. So yeah. yeah. One, one would hope. There are a lot of people who don't identify as digital humanists, even though we might uh, it push them into that category. And they really uh, push back against being identified in that way. So this is digital pedagogy is different from digital humanities in that it's really focused on the classroom, on that event in the classroom, and the syllabus and the assignments and those real projects that people are doing. Mm -hmm. I think digital humanities gave us a venue to talk about it, but digital humanities was computers and writing for the last 40 years before it was digital humanities. So we have a broad base to deal with. We're, we're not doing anything that's completely brand new. We're just building on what the industry has already done. Yeah, and I think if you look at the editorial board uh, that's involved here, you'll see that kind of scope and range across disciplines, people who, or maybe fields, people who identify with digital humanities and don't, and, and along a variety of reasons. Absolutely. What I would highlight, though, in terms of process, uh, also, um, Gentry mentioned the, the way that the MLA itself is kind of interacting with our editorial team over GitHub. And it's, I have to say, that, that's just been fascinating to see, um, you know, copy edits being submitted through pull requests from yeah. works that, of, of our repository that the MLA has made. Um, it's really fascinating to see all of that uh, public um, and and sort of shared and uh, I think to me what's interesting about it is that it brings to the fore the way in which the um, the very nature of what a press is right now at this moment is changing um, and how processes that that used to kind of epitomize the uh, the kind of the closed uh, uh, nature of 
academic scholarship are really now becoming kind of radically open and, and shared. And I think, you know, as the, what a press is, is being redefined, I think it's really interesting to be doing this openly and sort of document. Yeah. You can really see, you know, what is the work? Well, I can check that pull request and I can see what the work that was done is. I think, yeah, it's a sort of beautifully demystifying process for us as well at the MLA to just see you guys coming in and making the changes. And, you know, I think we all watch it with more than a little bit of a sense of voyeurism and <laughs> engagement <laughs> at the same time. But it, but it brings up issues too. I think Kathy asked, you know, the MLA recently, so how do we cite, a, you know, a specific uh, version of a keyword? And, you know, it brings up questions of, of citation and, and draft stages. And um, I do think that uh, Git is particularly well suited as a versioning system to you know, new new modes of citation. So we're helped there, but but what's cool about this is that we're kind of figuring this out together with the press as we go along. Yeah. And, and archiving as well too, right? Uh, along the lines of like what a press does, the, the way in which this, you know, this project I think assumes that redundancy is the best archiving strategy. Mm. Okay. Do you, um, what sort of gap do you guys feel like this is this is filling in the market, especially, I mean, I guess since you've been thinking about it since 2011, is there still a big gap and, and where do you see it being? I think one gap, and this is something that I see from my work because, you know, unlike the other editors, I'm actually a director of instructional and emerging technology, so I'm not in the classroom all the time. Um, I am working with faculty at my institution trying to get them to use technology in sort of interesting and innovative ways, and one of the biggest barriers we see is people want to know, they want to see concrete examples. So they don't want me to come and say, hey, you should use X technology in your teaching. So you should use a blog, or you should use GitHub. What they really want to see is what has somebody else done and that I can then adapt for myself. And I think one of the really interesting trends that we've seen already in some of the keywords have been people who've been citing examples of an assignment, and even there, they're saying, well, here's so-and-so's version of this assignment that was first done by this other person. And so I think it's really interesting to, to see the hacking of assignments going on and that kind of sharing. Um, and we're very much aware that that does go on. Like, I get all my best teaching ideas from other people. But um, it's kind of nice to see that sort of documented and made clear. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, so I think that sharing of models, even though there are repositories out there, I think the sharing of models piece fills the gap. But I think beyond that, um, it's taking all of them together and then trying to make a statement about what does this mean about digital pedagogy as a whole. And I think that um, there have certainly been reflective pieces about digital pedagogy, and there might be a certain um, temptation to, to sort of take one unified theory and then apply it. But what we're really arguing is that digital pedagogy is very heterogeneous and that by using this keyword approach where we can get at it from a lot of different points of view and by documenting it with the real pedagogical artifacts, that that's actually a much better approach to sort of take it as a whole and get it together. And I think by the time the project is finished, we're going to come to some very interesting conclusions on what digital pedagogy is based on the actual stuff of teaching and learning. And that I think those conclusions will be evolving and growing because even what we think the keywords are, I think, are growing and changing over time. And I think also that a lot of people have been, we, we see these requests across Twitter, has anybody done this? Or can you tell me where to find this assignment? I, I saw it go through Twitter a year ago and there's no way to find it again unless you just do a search and you remember the keywords that you search through. So mm -hmm. we're trying to create a possible venue for people to find and locate things with a resident set of tags or keywords that they can go they can go by. That is stable and sustained. And it's interesting that Rebecca says finished. I was gonna ask about that. <laughs> right. With all, with all DH projects and including this one in digital pedagogy, it's never finished, and we definitely have more than 50 keywords. We just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like it might be the you know 10 years down the line, you're like we're still working on this. <laughs> oh no, I don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, the other thing that's emerging to you. <laughs> I feel like the other thing that's kind of emerging is. I think in part because the, the notion of a pedagogical resource is kind of agnostic mm -hmm. toward the types of things that could be included. 
um, we're starting to see this kind of network of inspirations bubble up where you can see, oh, so that's where, you know, you, you know, this, this people, these people we've been following for some time um, go to for syllabi, for prompts, uh, for ideas. Um, and it's interesting to see the overlaps across entries, you know, you know ideas that, that continue to surface, people, uh, teams, uh, initiatives and efforts that, that continue to resurface. Um, but the other thing, too, I, I, that I don't think um, can be understated is the fact that, you know, this is a repository of material, so it isn't uh, only a website, right, but it can be something that's, that's you know, downloaded, that's modified, um, and with it with a change history, so you can see. Um, I think Kathy's talked about this on several occasions. The way in which you know certain projects have influenced others, and there's almost a kind of attribution built into it, mm -hmm. right? You know, if I've taken, I for example use Mark Sample's uh, rubric for blogging, mm -hmm. right? And I'm always trying to you know mark out like, oh, I this is from Mark's work, right? But can you can you have a, a publication project that does similar kind of attribution work over time, so that it's not just iterative, it's iteration with with attribution. Do you actually have anyone working on um, doing a sort of data visualization of the networks that you're uncovering here? You no, know, we have actually discussed this before. Yes, <laughs> this is something I want to have happen. You know, maybe I'll have to learn uh, networking, network analysis in order to do this. But I think it would be really interesting. Yes, because we know that those layers of influence are there. We know about it informally. So, like, I know, oh, here's this assignment that I've taught with before, and I stole that from Brian Coxall. And mm -hmm. Who knows where he got it? Uh, but, you know, we know this is happening, and, you know, we've seen sort of smaller versions of it. I think it would be really interesting mm -hmm. to trace the influence um, and to really visualize that network, which, you know, really gets back at the whole, you know, idea of connected learning. Yeah, I think so. Um, audience, what do you guys feel is your intended audience? Who, who are you writing this for? I mean, I think we're really trying to reach a pretty broad audience and that are, I mean, people who have not, who are interested in, you know, utilizing the web and technology in some way but don't have much experience or practice. I mean, this is, this is really a kind of way to jumpstart, you know, and, or sort of just kind of dip one's toe into it with a single assignment. So I, th I think we're, we're certainly um, not addressing the project towards, say, you know, a particular academic community, like just to the digital humanities community or just to um, computers and writing. We're really trying to open this up and have it be useful as a resource to people who are, you know, have heard about teaching with the web, with technology, but sort of don't really know how to get started. I think when it's all finished, when all the keywords are done, uh, you know, it will, as a whole, will, will provide a pretty robust uh, set of entry points for anyone kind of looking to get started. And I think, you know, even in the information design, we've got some ideas about how to do that. So in addition to having keywords, we're going to have these things tagged. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the tags we've talked about are really obvious, like, okay, this one might be tagged by a particular technology or a particular methodology or approach, but, you know, also tagging things by learning outcome, tagging mm -hmm. the microplan, so that people can get into it in multiple ways. Um, again, one of the experiences I've had a lot is um, people who say, I, who I would think are doing digital humanities work, and they would say, oh, I didn't know that was digital humanities, I was just doing my work. So I think we're very conscious of that as we try to reach out, that you don't have to self-identify as someone who does digital humanities or digital pedagogy to adapt a lot of this. Um, it may be that the uh, digital is the tool to reach your learning outcome, yeah. Right, right. So we want as broad an audience as possible, we want this to be this to speak to the people who do scholarship of teaching learning, people who are just interested in teaching whatever, you know, teaching this piece of humanities, and I think even beyond the humanities, there's probably a lot here uh, that would appeal to other places, other mm -hmm. people. Well, then, just, just uh, the conversation started for us when we were at one of the MLA conventions, and all four of us have all presented at the MLA on, on our pedagogy. And I try to sit in the back row and listen to the people who are just sneaking in and have conversations with them. Or I go to other conferences and talk to people about digital pedagogy. And their response is always, uh, and this was in particular to something really cool that Gentry was doing. Uh, a senior scholar turned to me and said, this is really great, but I don't, 
uh, do I have to do the entire project like this? Can I just do one thing? Mm -hmm. And the um, person who's a little jokey in me wanted to say, no, you must do it all. <laughs> Scare him away. But then we got into a conversation about how he could enter into doing using digital tools just by using one tool that's very small. Right. Something that's scalable because he was teaching a class of 300. So if we think about those kinds of things and trying not to intimidate people, but also thinking about issues of scale uh, and issues of, of the profession. Is this a lecturer? Is this somebody who's full time? Can they really handle it? Can they afford to do it? Uh, will they get in trouble if it doesn't work? Things like that. Right. I think that's all my questions for you guys. Do any of you have anything else you'd like to say about the project or share? I do have one thing to say about uh, just working in digital humanities in general has taught me the true idea of collaboration. And I don't think I knew what collaboration was as I was trying to even teach it to my students until I started working on this project with the other three general editors. It's extremely difficult. And it's sometimes contentious, but we're, we are all under the understanding that we respect each other's work and that we are moving forward in a way that we allow everybody to have a say in it. And, and so it's been a moment of, if I had to evaluate everybody in terms of collaborative teams, we all take our different roles, but we also all support each other. And I don't think that this has been true in academia in general, this idea of collaboration. So I was happy to be able to take this one. But it's definitely it's a lot of talking and meeting and trying to figure out uh, and being honest with each other about what it is that we want coming from this. And really coming to some agreement. <laughs> or maybe <Yeah>. just... <laughs> and the other thing I would just mention is that we're very grateful to everything that especially Kathleen Fitzpatrick has done and being very open-minded about where this project's been going, how it's changed over time, um, and just you know being willing to take a chance because I, I realize part of it it's there's there's being inventive and, and creative, but then you know for many people that's also chancy. So we really re we really respect that and admire that about the MLA and, and, and Kathleen in particular. She's she's a little blessing. Yes. <laughs> I think one other thing to add that we haven't talked a lot about is just, you know, beyond the four of us, I mean, we're talking about collaboration, but beyond the four of us being general editors, you know, we have an advisory board that really helped shape where this project was going and are going to continue to play in a role. And then we also have all the curators. So I think, you know, this maybe gets back to your question about what the gaps are. What's really interesting to me is how many people we've been, we are able to involve in the work of right. this project. And I think that's going to, you know, really shape it in a way as well. And you were talking about sort of those networks of influence, but again, we're taking a networked approach about building a definition of digital pedagogy, and I think that's that's going to be very interesting. And and the advantage of that too is just it having that much more reach. You know, all those people in their networks, and you know, they've skin in the game. So hopefully, you get a fantastic response to it. Yeah, and I think you know once we move into open peer review again, that that's that community that Matt was mentioning. Yeah, I mean, and we we have you know right now 15 keywords, each uh, each one uh, created and curated by a particular scholar with 10 entries in each one of those. So that's you know 500 resources right off the bat, um, you know that will be part of this project. So it's it's just exciting to sort of see this all coming together. Yeah. And people-wise, I mean, even some of those um, keywords are curated by more than one person. Mm -hmm. I think that was a surprise to me that we had people coming back saying, I want to do this. Can I invite so-and-so? I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> That's great. Okay, thank you so much, all of you. It's been yeah. really lovely talking to you. Um, and if you think of anything else you'd like to say or add, you can email me. Um, but, yeah, thank you. I'm going to stop the broadcast. Yeah.